from MTN News, this is Montana This Morning. A quiet neighborhood that woke up to the sirens and screams of a murder. Hear from one of those neighbors as they relive a night they won't soon forget. After two years of being canceled, the Montana Folk Festival is expected to give a much needed boost to local businesses. Good morning, Southwest Montana. Gosh, I just know John Amy is so hyped oh, for this weekend. It, yeah. <laughs> 6.31, Ashley Washburn alongside Matt Elwell. Well, what's going to be a pretty eventful weekend you know, here in so Southwest There's so much going Montana. on. Uh, and for the most part, we're going to see quiet weather for the vast majority of the area. But we do have some thunder showers out there. Temperatures a little cooler this morning than they were yesterday. Just in comparison, we're, yesterday we were near 60. Today we're into the 40s and mid 50s, so a little cooler. We did have a little bit of shower activity, still do. That's all falling apart. That's not a big issue for us um, for the morning. The afternoon, spotty thunder showers possible as you get into the mid to late part of the afternoon. The early evening, it looks like it clears out. This is at 6.15. Remember, Montana Folk Festival kicking off at 6. There you go. Plan that you heard perfectly. It here first, yeah. <laughs> uh, temperatures uh, likely to bring at least uh, the possibility of thunder showers warmer uh, early on. We are seeing the potential of maybe a passing shower in the morning in the Bozeman area, but really the afternoon the best potential. We're going to talk about a huge warm up coming up in just a few minutes. We will see you in a bit. 632 now. People who live in a quiet Bozeman neighborhood were jolted awake early Thursday morning by screams. An 18 year old man was found dead. Another man facing murder charges. MTN's Jay McDonald spoke with people shocked that something like that could happen in their neighborhood. In a quiet neighborhood, this house right behind me is a rental property that turned into a crime scene of a murder as neighbors looked on in horror as they saw sirens and lights and noise fill their quiet community. I was woken up um, to screaming outside and the screaming lasted, you know, like one to two minutes roughly. I knocked on several doors in this quiet neighborhood looking for people who heard the commotion. Heard sirens. Thought, man, that sounds like it's right out my house. So there I were cop cars down that street on that side of the intersection and then on this side as well. Something like that in this neighborhood is very unusual. It's usually a, a very quiet neighborhood. According to the charging documents, two 911 calls came in two minutes apart from the same number, reporting a man had stabbed himself. First responders descended upon Brendan Street. After they were in there a while, I saw them start to kind of come out slowly, a lot slower than they went in, <laughs> and I noticed they didn't bring anybody out. According to court documents, a man and woman were also in the home. The man, Francisco Padilla Canales, spoke with detectives, saying he had placed a GPS tracker on his wife's car, suspecting her of having an extramarital affair. The defendant is dangerous. Um, he is, is clever. Charging documents say Padilla Canales followed his wife to the rental property where she worked and cleaned. He entered the fenced backyard, went through the back door, and found his wife and the victim in the bedroom. This defendant uh, threatened her and basically uh, asked her to lie for him with regard to uh, how uh, the stabbing took place. According to court documents, Padilla Canales told detectives that he lunged at the victim and stabbed him. His wife had fled the scene, but Padilla Canales brought her back, and then he had her call 911 and report the victim had attempted suicide. For one neighbor who sees the home every day, it's a night she'll never forget. The fact that something pretty significant happened really close to me, and... I'm just thankful I was safe and my family was safe. Another neighbor is thinking of the victim's family. Um, I just hope that, you know, there can be justice brought to the victim and I, I hope that, you know, my thoughts and prayers go out to the victim's family um, during this incredibly terrible time. Bond was set at $1 million and Padilla Canales will be seen in district court on July 22nd. In Bozeman, Jane McDonald, MTN News. Yellowstone National Park is getting some high level attention this morning. Interior Secretary Deb Holland is in the park to talk about the effort to repair roads and other infrastructure damaged by record floods in June. MTS John Shearer has the latest on road access in the park. Both the north and south loops through the park are now open to traffic. But the road from Roosevelt Junction to Silvergate and Cook City remains closed. That means the popular Lamar Valley, renowned for its great animal sightings, remains off limits to visitors. 
That's because of this damage to the road near Trout Lake. This new video of the damage was recently provided by the Park Service. Also damaged on that route is a large section of the road near the Soda Butte picnic area. The other part of the park that sustained heavy damage is the road from the small gateway community of Gardner up to park headquarters at Mammoth. In some new information MTN received from a park official, we've learned that no work is currently underway on that road. It's because engineers are still assessing the damage and devising a plan for repairs or rerouting the road. Park Superintendent Cam Scholey said two weeks ago that the road may be moved to prevent similar damage again in the future. The official we spoke with says it's possible construction work on the road will not even be able to start until next season. In the meantime, work is underway on the old Gardner Road as shown in this photo. That road, a former stagecoach road, is being upgraded to accommodate a limited amount of traffic into the park. It is unclear when that work will be finished and who will be allowed to use the road. A major issue for Holland is paying for repairs in Yellowstone and infrastructure work at other popular national parks. Montana U.S. Senator Steve Daines pushed through National Parks Infrastructure Funding with the Land and Water Conservation Fund. That totals about $900 million a year. Plus, the bipartisan infrastructure law included $1.7 billion for transportation infrastructure. But altogether, it's still not enough. Testifying before the House Appropriations Committee, John Garter, the Director of Budget and Appropriations for the National Park Conservation Alliance said repairs at Yellowstone alone could total more than a billion dollars. There are emergency appropriations from the Interior and Transportation Departments to pay for temporary road repairs in the park, but a permanent solution is a much larger job that will take a lot of time, perhaps years, to complete. Well, people can expect some great music this weekend in Butte for the Montana Folk Festival, and many businesses are expecting to make great profits, too. MTN's John Amy has more. With the Montana Folk Festival expected to bring tens of thousands of people to Butte, the sound of cash registers ringing up will be music to the ears of many local businesses. Two years ago, you made me cry, and uh, you're not going to be able to do that this year. I'm very happy. It's coming back. The free three-day music festival had been going strong in Butte since 2008, before it was sidelined by COVID-19. We haven't had it for a few years, and now that it's back, we're starting to see an influx of people already starting to come into Butte. It's, it's been amazing. It just, the energy uptown just feels vibrant. Many local business owners say they rely on this festival and the summer tourism season to keep them in the black. And it's something that we come to count on um, as we hire uh, local employees. We hire extra people during this time period as well. The economic impact of the folk festival is significant. The event brings about 150,000 people to Butte and between eight to $10 million to the local economy and somewhere between 25 and $30 million to the state economy. Hopefully their pockets are full of money and they feel grateful that the, there's no admission and they go spend it in local businesses. The past two years without the festival was a challenging time for Butte businesses. It was pretty, it was pretty heartbreaking, it, you know, in the beginning, you know, to um, just, it was like a ghost town up here, and, and that was pretty scary. I think in the end, those of us who were able to stick it out actually, you know, have become better business people because of it. And business should be good for the festival, which begins Friday and runs through Sunday. Impute John Amy, MTN News.
Two years in the making. I know. How exciting. Uh, and we've had some pretty hefty rain showers mm -hmm. during the uh, Montana Folk Festival before. Uh, today, the showers should end right about the time that uh, the Montana Folk Festival begins. Isolated to widely scattered thunder showers Saturday afternoon. Sunday looks absolutely fantastic. Don't cancel the plans. I think there may be showers in the area, maybe not directly overhead. Just plan accordingly. That's right. And have fun usual. this weekend and definitely don't drink and drive. That's right. Well,